The Hogs Night is brought to you by TicketClub.com, your one-stop shop for live events nationwide. Whether you're looking for game, theater, or live performance tickets, don't sweat it. TicketClub.com has you covered. So make sure you're going there for all your live entertainment needs, and make sure you're clicking over to them from the banner at the top of the hogsdie.com. <laughs> It's Just Business with Steve Thomas and John Wool. And now, here's your host, Chris Leary. Hello and welcome to another episode of It's Just Business on the Hogstyle Network, a show where we look at the dollars and cents of the sports media industrial business complex. We're out here on the edge of town at the uh, business park discussing these topics. How you doing, Steve? Yeah, good. And yeah, today we're in the the hog size business offices. Uh, you know, we've got one in uh, the New York, greater New York City area, and one in the greater Houston area, uh, which is where we're located. You know, this fine morning. Yeah, I'm doing okay. You know, hanging in there. <laughs> um, you know, getting ready for a big weekend of Redskins football. Of course, it'll be over by the time you guys hear this. Um, but I'm not. I'm not really hopeful, shall we say, of Redskins 49ers. <laughs> Probably not something to get your hopes up over. We're recording this on uh, the Saturday before the game, and I can officially report it is already over. <laughs> it's The game is over before it <laughs> began, folks. <laughs> no joke, though. The, the 49ers look very good. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they do. I mean, we did our game preview episode a few days ago, and, I mean, they're no joke, man. Yeah, you know, and, and we got I got some um, we got some 49ers fans listening to that episode, and of course their 49ers fans are obnoxious. In case anybody doesn't realize that, um, they're just obnoxious, and you know it, they're they're these guys are like mad that we weren't praising the 49ers enough. And I usually don't respond to trolls because you know I don't really care. You know, troll us fine, but one of them I responded to him. It's like. You know, listen, we predicted, all three of us predicted blowouts. Jamal wasn't on the show, so we had three people. All three of us predicted blowouts. I don't know what more you want us to say. You know, know, do do you want us to, you know, bow down, you know, literally to the 49ers superiority? We talked about your great defense. We talked about your offense. We said you were going to blow us out. You know, I don't know what you want, so just stop. I'd rather you not listen than just come back with nonsense. (laughs) Right, especially since they're, they're going to get the last laugh, so calm down. Exactly right. Yeah, they're going to get the last laugh. Oh, well, less said about that probably for the best. So let's instead jump into uh, international commerce, politics, uh, and look at this NBA, NBA China story, which I think actually just blew up or start the, the, the Morley tweet heard around the world – was right after the we recorded our last show and I was like oh that that probably that's a good topic but in 2 weeks this won't you know it'll be in in the rear view given today's media and news culture but this one's got legs here it is just as relevant 2 weeks later yeah he actually tweeted that on the Friday Friday October 4th and it didn't really become a story till like you know, a couple of days later, which we missed it by, you know, probably hours, you know, honestly, because uh, we recorded that last show on Saturday. So what happened where all this nonsense started was that um, to back up, the NBA has always in bed with been in bed with China. You know, like Kobe Bryant made an annual pilgrimage back when he was playing, you know, every year in the off season to sell shoes and blah, 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 whatnot. And I don't know how far back it goes, but um, every year for the foreseeable past the nba has been in doing stuff in china individual players they've had games there before preseason games so they had a couple preseason games scheduled in china uh this month which have now have already happened it was the los angeles lakers my beloved lakers and the nets are over there so the day before the game daryl morey who is the general manager of the houston rockets tweeted the following Fight for freedom, stand for Hong Kong. Now, to me, that's a pretty innocuous statement. It's pretty obvious. Uh, You know, I mean, freedom is always a good thing, generally speaking. But the Chinese government took great offense to this. I mean, like, great offense. And that caused a whole humongous backlash. Now, let's just go back a little bit briefly into history. And 
I don't want to turn this into a history lesson, but just generally speaking, the reason why this is an issue at all is this. Hong Kong is, for those of you who don't know, Hong Kong is not a regular part of mainland China, okay? It was colonized by the British in the 1800s, 1842. The British controlled Hong Kong for 150 years or so they via a lease, a 99-year lease. They turned it back over to the Chinese government in 1997, but all that time and still since then, to a certain extent, Hong, the Hong, province of Hong Kong has had a completely different economic system and theoretically a representative government that has become less and less representative every year that now that the Chinese are in charge. Um, and so the reason why this is an issue this year is that the Chinese people have been, or the people of Hong Kong rather, have been protesting the authorita authoritative, authoritarian control of China over Hong Kong. And so there's been a bunch of protests over various laws and whatnot and over the lack of representation. So in the face of all of that, the NBA is over there trying to play preseason games and make money. And then Daryl Morey tweets this. Fight for freedom, stand for Hong Kong. So what happened as a result of all that is that the Chinese Basketball Association immediately, led by Yao Ming, by the way, immediately totally disassociated themselves with the Houston Rockets, with the NBA. Um, there are rumors to a certain... We, we don't really know, uh, but there, the rumor on the street was that the Chinese government came to the NBA and asked them to fire Daryl Morey. The NBA denied that. Who knows what's true or not. Um, but it caused protests, probably driven by the Chinese government, and all sorts of stuff the the Lakers and the Nets players were caught in the middle of it because then they theoretically were going to have to answer all these questions and so then the Chinese prevented them from speaking to the press uh, LeBron James got involved which we'll be get to in the middle of this which we'll get to in in a minute because I have a lot to say about him um, so that's the backdrop here um, and it the ramifications are still going on you know the NBA lost a ton of money the Houston Rockets were basically the national team of China because of the Yao Ming connection. That's over with. Um, Chris, your general thoughts. Yeah, this is... Um, it's interesting because these the issues that the NBA has here are writ large on all kinds of governments and businesses because of the strange pseudo-independent city-state status of Hong Kong. And... It really is in the modern world a very interesting setup of China, which is essentially government-controlled capitalism. Still with our, I cannot say that word either. Authoritarian, whatever. Uh, dictator. Authoritarian. I thought, yeah. yeah uh, leadership. So the, they they act like a very aggressive capitalist mentality, except for all that is sort of government-controlled. It's like a very strange hybrid. Um, so. And because everyone has to deal with China and everyone has to deal with Hong Kong, this – every government and company in the world that has any kind of global reach has versions of the NBA problem. And something was going to spark and it doesn't – in hindsight, it, it makes perfect sense that one of the globe's sexiest brands and something with a, an entertainment sports product would be the one that steps in it to this degree. And if you followed – China's relationship with the NBA on all levels, players, commerce, business, new markets, yada, yada, then this is about a 20, 25 year story about China and the NBA. So this, it doesn't surprise me that this, this rocked it at this level, but at the same time, you know, the U.S. government has this problem. Many giant companies have this problem. In fact, there's probably a lot of people that are perfectly happy to sit on the sidelines doing the exact same stuff the NBA does and have the NBA take all of the, the hits, the grief, et cetera, et cetera, and be the sacrificial lamb. Yeah. Um, first of all, let me make abundantly clear that, you know, personally, um, you know, I think the Chinese government is abhorrent. You know, they murder their own people. It's you know, basically you know I, I I hate to call them a dictatorship because I, I in my head I think of a dictatorship as one single you know Muammar Gaddafi you know type and that's not how the Chinese government is set up so I don't know if you can really call it a dictatorship but but they are it is most definitely an oppressive regime and most definitely their goal with Hong Kong is to get them assimilated into fully assimilated into the Chinese 
oppressive authoritarian regime as soon as possible, obviously. And so that's why they've been chipping away at the freedoms that the British established in Hong Kong. So let's get back to Daryl Morey. This is dumb, okay, of Daryl Morey. Daryl Morey should know better. I, I totally agree with you with, with him. You know, fight for freedom, stand for Hong Kong, you know, fine. Yes, absolutely. But when you're the GM of the Houston Rockets in particular, you're going to tweet something like that out. Your tweet is going to make no difference, and it's going to help no one. And you should have known better. Daryl Morey is an MIT grad. He's not a dumb guy. And he should have known, particularly because of the Rockets, that this was going to cause more problems than it helps. You know, um, so he should have known better. What What is very, very disappointing to me is that the NBA utterly didn't support him. The NBA completely threw this dude under the bus. They came out and apologized uh, to the Chinese I don't. The NBA denies that they apologized, but they apologized to the Chinese for Daryl Morey. They disassociated themselves with him, and they rolled over and basically said Daryl Morey uh, doesn't really understand the situation. It, you know, uh, and the you know the Chinese people. Are, you know, the Chinese government is wonderful, and all of this. They didn't use those words. I'm just being facetious, but that's sort of the direction they were going because obviously they don't want to lose all the money. You know, clearly. So what irritates me about this is that, um, you know, it's out there. Why can't the NBA stand for freedom, at least to some extent? This is the league that lets their players ramble on about absolutely everything, which I support, you know, support the idea that they ramble on, you know, about everything. Um, you know, and it's the, the NBA is known as kind of the woke sports league, um, you know, for a reason. But this is the hill you're going to die on. You're going to let LeBron James and Steve Kerr and Greg Popovich mercilessly bash the president, which is their right and fine. Um, but then you're going to die on the hill of protecting the reputation of China. You know, I don't, I just don't understand that at all. And I'm disappointed in it. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I have no, I have no, Solid rebuttal to that. They've solidly put on the hypocrisy hair shirt, no doubt. Um, except to say that <laughs> you know it. The fact that they did this pretty much under underscores Steve your worldview as well as probably the worldview of the show, which is that you know markets and, and yeah. <laughs> you know the financial the, the ultimate financial goal is the only true driver. So from <laughs> it's perfectly understandable from that vantage point. I mean China is a ginormous market. Basketball has caught fire there over 25 years. It represents probably the last biggest conquerable market which they are close to you know, getting pretty good penetration on. So from a, in fact, you know, China is probably much more lucrative to them from a governmental relations standpoint than the United States to some degree. So, yeah, I mean, there, there's more, there, there's certainly more available capital to be had in China because yeah. they already have what they, what they have basically in the United States. So yeah, it's a more, it's a growing market. So it's know, not, China for it's sure. not illogical. It could be immoral, could be hypocritical, could be wrong but it's not from that from that pure business standpoint it's not illogical that they would acquiesce to whatever length it does to keep their deals in place yeah it's just sad and pathetic is yes. what it is but you know the you're right chris i mean the 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 theme of this show from day one which is what we've wanted to get across to people from day the very first episode was that in sports money rules everything you know it it can it guides what owners do it guides what players do it's you know, it certainly is the reason why the NBA is kowtowing to China. You know, absolutely. Um, it's just disappointing. I, why can't the NBA come out and say something like, you know, we respect, you know, we respect the, the wonderful people of China. Um, you know, however, you know, certainly Daryl Morey has the right to, you know, free to express himself. But more importantly, we, we strongly support the, uh, the need for freedom across the globe freedom and civil rights across the globe certainly the NBA stands for that and you know you know we hope that china gets there too or something like that I, wouldn't that be better than just what they said you know and here's the other p way i want to go with this lebron james has really showed what an utter fool he is in this so um lebron obviously is a laker and he was involved right in the middle of this because the lakers and the nets as i said were in china at the time and so the players, understandably, when they were in China, were apparently there was a players-only meeting with the Lakers and the Nets, and then they got the NBA involved because it truly is 
a bad thing to have the players basically be the voice, you know, to the Chinese media about this. I totally understand that. But so once the event was over, the Lakers come back to the United States. LeBron is now asked about this by the Lakers media and the national media. And so then he proceeds to say that Daryl Morey <laughs> um, didn't really understand what he was talking about. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, he didn't understand the situation and he should have, uh, you know, done a better job of thinking of thinking before he tweeted. Now, certainly he should have thought before he tweeted, as I said. But the idea of the high school graduate, LeBron James, who is like the wokest player in the country, who has continually himself spoke up on a huge variety of civil rights issues and has been supported by the league and by the public. He's spoken up politically. He's bashed the president, you know, in tweets and live. He's going to tell Daryl Morey, who again is an MIT grad, that Daryl Morey doesn't understand. Just it makes LeBron James look hypocritical. It makes him look stupid. It makes him look like a fool. And I was very disappointed in that aspect of it. Yeah, no doubt. I I, I definitely was like, come on, dude. When I saw that, you know, because he could have, you know, the easy the easy path is the wimpiest path. Yes, but you you can no comment, and I need to research more. What Steve Kerr said, oh, I gotta you know I gotta go take a uh, I gotta go uh, audit a college course on the sub uh, the Chinese U S relations. You know, there's e there's ways to there's ways to kind of you know gently walk through this and stay relatively unscathed. You might take you know you might get a couple eye rolls about being wimpy, but that's about it. You don't need to stick your your foot in it and come out this hypocritical but you know at this point oh, steve i can't imagine it. i can't believe i'm saying this but at this point you know <laughs> some of this you know there's a brand and this goes all the way up to the nba goes to lebron goes about you know the kind of you know woke tm right the the wokeness as trademark as brand is just as cynical or just as calculated as any other kind of front of a brand and so like when you get to something like this it it pokes through that that kind of marketing facade fairly quickly when the when the issues become complex deep multifaceted uh risk everywhere right when the stakes are that high which is what this represents then those those kinds of brands and uh you know lip service don't are, have less effectiveness and that goes to that goes to daryl morley too like i uh, obviously, I support his right to say it. I, I agree with him, probably philosophically, on the subject matter. But this idea that a tweet is going to solve anything, unless you're running like some kind of action network, you know, on the ground in Egypt during the revolution. But this idea that sending a tweet from a privileged Western rich vantage point is going to have any effect that's not purely negative, um, and that you're you're somehow like stamping your you know your opinion out there and some ridiculous tweet is is it dumb on daryl morley's part and also is just also about the culture right now anyway that things like sending a tweet is going to matter any in any way to your your end goals which is also another piece that's ridiculous and the houston rockets aspect of this is totally fascinating because if this had been the milwaukee bucks general manager you know, the, the relationships are this high stakes. It probably causes a little bit of stir. But to come from the national team of China, Yao Ming's team, you know, that that just, I think, was the real powder keg to blow this up into a multi-week story. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and listen, I mean, Daryl Morey has 238,000 followers on Twitter. And the, like you said, the idea that his tweet was going to change anybody's mind or do any good or whatsoever is completely foolish and he should have known better and there's no re especially when he knows that there are two NBA teams in China right when he sent it out I mean it was a dumb thing to do there's no doubt you know but you know I I, I hear you about kind of walking the line and not being a hypocrite like LeBron was but Steve Kerr I think is a hypocrite himself you know, because he's also been very public about um, politics in this country. Um, why can't instead of Kerr saying, you know, I need to learn more about it and I need to take a civics class or whatever it is he said, what would be so so bad about saying, you know, you know, listen, you know, I support freedom all around the world. Why can't you say that? Because you've been bashing 
you know, Donald Trump for years, you know, about those type of things. Why do you have to pretend like you don't know? It's obvious that there is, you know, that what China is. Everybody knows it. You don't have to bash China like Daryl Morey did, but you can certainly say, you know, I'm, I generally support freedom and just leave it at that. I, wouldn't that be a better way to walk it back? <laughs> no, I, yes, of course. I have no, <laughs> it's not really, yeah. a, there's not really a, a, a good counter argument, argument to that. Um, I was only having, using Steve Kerr because at least he was a at least he was a little bit more artful in his ability to say right. nothing than LeBron was. That was my only point. Well, this is the thing. Let me say this, you know, um, and this isn't just really so much guided at LeBron or not guided. This isn't really directed so much at LeBron in particular. But I think it's high time that we stop paying attention to the, the s- pretend sophisticated opinions of athletes. Okay. LeBron James is a brilliant basketball player, you know, um, and he's, you know, he's charismatic, you know, he's marketable, you know, he's had people around him that have built his brand up and all that. But at the end of the day, he's a high school graduate who doesn't know anything about geopolitics. It's high time we stop looking to athletes to get political opinions, to get sophisticated uh, opinions on economics and freedom and geopolitics, all that. Nobody should be paying attention to what LeBron James and Draymond Green and, you know, pick your athlete. Nobody should pay attention to what these people have to say about anything like that. You know, now certainly they know about, you know, where they came from, you know, their personal experiences. They know about athletics. But the idea that anybody should care about what any athlete says about international politics is just foolish and it's high time we stop paying attention to it i think um not to say they don't have the right to say it i don't don't misunderstand me they do but the idea that it's given credence these guys are ball players okay some of them are smart some of them are dumb uh, you know uh, just like every aspect of society but these aren't the people we should be looking to towards to get sophisticated opinions on things like that that's my point there's a lot of yes. There's a lot of validity to that. I would argue that the culture is just that right now where everyone gets an opinion and everyone can voice it. So, oh sure, but Absolutely. I'm not denying that. I yeah, I'm, no, I, no, I'm not saying I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying like that's sort of the, you know, everyone's doing that from Joe on the street to so it's just, it's just sort of in the ether. But I will say without going too deep, that argument would hold a lot more water if we weren't currently led by a reality television star and marketing genius who could define what a curd was and not a cheese curd so I, listen i mean so, he's a lawfully elected president of the united states i mean you know i hear you but but, but but is his platform as a reality television star and general sea level celebrity any different than an athlete um i mean yes because um, you know, and I'm not wild about Donald Trump either, and we're that we're not going to turn this into the political hour because that's going to go badly. Um, I did vote for him, but he's at least educated. He's a sophisticated businessman. He's not a guy who's been dribbling a basketball, you know. And the reality stuff came m- much later. You know, we could argue his academic prowess and what his SAT scores are, but nobody can deny that he's at least a sophisticated, he was a sophisticated businessman long before all that other stuff came up. There's a big difference between a 30-year-old who's been playing basketball for 15 years or whatever. uh, Yeah, I don't want to go into too, I disagree completely that he, you you could easily make a case about his business acumen over his business career, and one, and two, I don't, it's actually less of a political point than it seems. I'm just saying that someone who completely rehabilitated their career by at, 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 uh, the, and their image by being on a reality television sh- show shows that the wider culture cares much less about things like degrees, experience, uh, terms of service. So it, it doesn't surprise me that suddenly everybody's experts. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I mean, although he's not the first. You know, Ronald Reagan was an actor, and he turned out to be an outstanding president. Yeah, but he also did eight uh, terms know. as California governor in between. Yeah, them, and you know, led the it's, Screen Actors know, Guild. Yeah, I, you know, like uh, Jimmy Carter, you know, was a farmer. You know, before he became the governor of Georgia, you know, when he was the governor of Georgia. Yeah, 
at one point in time. Um, uh, you know, I don't know, like Ulysses S. Grant was a, you know, a general who didn't know anything really about politics and he got elected based on his, you know, his reputation in the Civil War. I mean, there's a history of this. Not everybody is a long time, like George Bush lifetime, George Bush Sr. lifetime in politics kind of thing. Um, but I hear you. I, I think certainly, you know, the Donald Trump culture has caused a lot of this controversy in that just the way he acts and the way he operates and the way he presents himself causes a lot of folks on the other side a lot you know to respond and it gets ugly and he's certainly the cause of it and so i think that it it pushes folks like lebron james to the forefront you know if that's what you're trying to say yeah I agree with you. well just a, and i actually argue that donald trump is a symptom not the disease right the disease of like notoriety celebrity however it's defined jumping over expertise training experience was already like my point that that trump is a result of that not the driver now he may he might be a giant amplifier at that point and obviously president of the united states but like that was a again it was a symptom not the disease yeah yeah i agree you know yeah that's probably true um but I, you know just to summarize this um one the nba's response was pathetic you don't go out and apologize to China. And then they tried to apologize for the apology. There were two statements the NBA put out. One was the apology to China. And the other one was another statement by Adam Silver that said, we didn't actually apologize, but we still, <laughs> but we still apologize, but it was not an apology. And then, so there's that, which all of that was just sad and just come out. I would respect Adam Silver more if he just come out and said, look, we have a lot of business interests in China. We want to maintain those business interests. And so, therefore, Daryl Morey should not have gotten into politics. And what we want to do is dribble basketball and sell basketballs and basketball tickets. And that's the end of the story. That would have been far more honest, and I could have respected that. But don't go this line about, you know, the wonderful Chinese people and blah, blah, blah. That makes me want to shoot myself. Yeah, and they didn't know. have to do – like, Coke, Google, and the United States government basically do exactly what you said. Yeah, Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. You know, and what the NBA, the NBA, you know, Adam Silver is not a politician either. He's a dude who manages dudes who dribble basketballs. He's not, you know, an ambassador. He doesn't know what to say. He shouldn't have said anything. And as a matter of fact, if they just let it go and said nothing, it probably would have blown over, you know, to a certain extent. They could have hand massaged the Chinese government under the table, you know, probably not turned into a big thing. Okay. So that's point number one. And then point number two, um, LeBron James is abs absurd and an idiot. And in point number three, I think the larger problem I have is is today's society is one that we actually care about what people like LeBron James say on things like this, and that just makes me sad. So there you go. Yeah, I, I am deeply uh, I am deeply disappointed. Maybe is the right word in the in their craven hypocrisy when. There was even better versions of being cravenly hypocritical that could have got them. <laughs> exactly you know? right. Like yeah. you, you know, I'm just judging like why you couldn't even be get craven hypocrisy right, and that's the ultimately the disappointing <laughs> you know, part. Like here's the thing. Like it's not like you know me, Chris, enough to know I'm a I'm a pretty staunch political conservative. That's not to say I still really support the Republican Party too much, but I'm a staunch political conservative. I would respect the opinion, and I would read the opinion of Noam Chomsky. For example, because he's <laughs> he's an academic, you know, he's at least sophisticated. He's smart. I don't agree with anything he says at all, but I would at least respect his opinion enough to to read it and analyze it and then laugh at it, you know. Whereas at least he's qualified to have opinions, have nutty opinions like he has, you know. Whereas, you know, like like the the. the <laughs> Like the other one, this is coming on the heels, by the way, and we need to move on to another story, but this is coming on the heels of the NBA a couple months ago eliminating the word owner and now using the word governor. And this is because Draymond Green, who is worth tens of millions of dollars, said he feels like a slave when the NBA teams are owned by owners. And I would just ask, because I have no doubt that Draymond Green has an LLC or two, because he's no doubt selling crap on his website or other things. He probably has investments. Are you the owner of your LLC? Are you the owner of your house? You know, do you have employees? Are you, you know, do you own a company that has people work for it? Are you the governor? It's just ridiculous. And so the that's the level of wokeness that the NBA has gotten to. And 
then they're going to have this hypocritical stance on China. It just the NBA needs to stop. Stop talking. Just play basketball. So, the I'm done. Uh, I can't disagree with that too much. All right, so next we're going to get into a couple stories of high finance and professional sports leagues. Uh, the first one, the first one we're going to talk about has to do with Major League Baseball, which we will stay away from current sports t- baseball topics to, in deference to Steve. Go Nats! <laughs> um, Nats suck. <laughs> so the first one is that Major League Baseball... I threw you off your game. What? I know. I threw you off your game with that one. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to decide if we wanted to have a, a baseball fight or not. No, we um, do not. So the, Major League Baseball is thinking about relaxing its rules about uh, financier groups having multiple stakes and multiple teams. Yes. So all none of the major U.S. sports leagues will allow institutional investors, meaning big corporations – to own primary stakes and be principal owners of corporations nowadays. Major League Baseball used to be like that. Fox owned the Dodgers. Nintendo owned the Mariners. But that's not going to get approved anymore. And the reason is mainly that, theoretically at least, they want one single owner who cares about the sports aspect of it and doesn't treat it just like a business. This is why you don't see, like, you know, I don't know, GM own the Detroit Lions. This is why you have the Ford family own the Lions. <laughs> you know, I said that wrong. That's why you don't have Ford Corporation owning the Lions. Instead, you have the Ford family owning the Lions. It's because the rules don't allow for this. And the reason, again, is you don't want the Detroit Lions to just become just another corporate asset. You want somebody, hypothetically, who cares about these teams and guiding the, each team toward, you know, towards victory and producing quality results on the field and everything else. So what the in, in what Major League Baseball has done or is about to do or is considering doing is relaxing these rules to allow institutional investors to take minority stakes. And by institutional investors, what we're really talking about are New York equity firms. Okay, <laughs> that's really what we're talking about here, um, primarily because I don't think you're going to see, you know, GM by a team. What you're going to see are a bunch of Wall Street guys and a bunch of Wall Street funds invest in it. Um, at least that's my thought. Now, the article we, we found about this is on John Wall Street, dated October 18th, called MLB Alters Bylaw, Bylaws Permitting Institutional Investors to Take Limited Interest in Multiple Clubs. Um, and the interesting part about this is there, this article insinuates that a minority stake in a baseball team actually might not be a particularly good investment for some of these equity, you know, Wall Street equity funds, and that there might be actually a better way to make a higher rate of return than a sports team, which surprised me a little bit. But when you think about it, maybe the margins aren't big enough, you know, when you're talking about a fund like that. Uh, but I, I think that, and I'll shut up after this, I think this is a horrible idea because really and truly, I don't think you want big business guiding sports teams. That's bad for the brand, I think. Yeah, and bad for Thoughts. the local con- the the local importance and connections to those teams to their markets, which you get these interests that are national, if not global interests. Then they're what what they're the not. It's not just that it's the bottom line, but it's the the bottom line with no connection local. That's another danger. Uh, yeah, yeah this, that's a good point. That's th- a good this, point. You know, I mean, we see this. I mean, we see giant equity firms all the time b- gobble up or own or gain stakes in companies, and then when it's time to break them up or sell them for parts or you know, so that that's in that world that's business. So if they start to get into this. You know what would make us if they're into a sports team to a large amount, and they have they can somehow get some kind of controlling interest in some way. What would be why why would they have practices that would be any different just because it's sports? That's a big danger. But I love speaking to your point about like is this even like you know is this sort of profit risk masters in these equity firms make these you know decide what to do with their money or other people's money? Um, I love this John Wall quote. Uh, I guess John Wall Street, not John Wall, uh, said, for starters, it seems unlikely that the savvy investor would put money into an asset that one respected sports financier called passive, limited, and illiquid. If it's about generating a return and not stroking one's ego, a pro sports team is probably not an ideal investment. And that really speaks to, you know, that 
there is something, there's this cachet, I'm in this club that's able to own this, I want a toy, there's this whole, yes, no one's getting into it to lose money from the owner standpoint, but that, there is that mix of ego and available profit to lose and slowly make over time that really, that quote really speaks to in terms of why this probably won't be a hot market for private equity firms. Yeah. Um, so I've looked into a little bit the annual net income of at least NFL teams. It's really hard to tell, get specifics, because aside from the Packers, you know, it's not public information. But the, generally speaking, the rate of return, the annual net income, rather, on NFL teams is somewhere between like 30 and 60 or 70 million a year. That's, that's the net income, roughly. Major League Baseball, and that's all of them because the NFL is, a, you know, a communist, you know, society and all profits are, most profits are shared. MLB isn't like that, and so the profit margins uh, vary wildly. Um, and then there is, there are, there is money going from the rich teams to the poor teams in there. But that's, the, generally speaking, the rate of return, at least in NFL teams. So what I think the John Wall Street thing is going getting at is, especially in today's market, I don't know how much more of these that the, the true value in Major League Baseball teams is the value of the franchise itself. So if you bought a team, you know, like like George Bush was the owner of the Texas Rangers, what twenty years ago at least, twenty five years ago maybe more, you know, and I don't know what he paid, but it was probably a few million, a hundred, couple hundred million dollars, you know. Well, you know, the Texas Rangers today are worth billions. Is you're not going to get away. You know, even the the lowliest team is going to be a couple billion dollars, and so that that's a huge rate of return. I don't know how much more are we really going to see Major League Baseball teams or any sports teams double, triple, quadruple in value again in the next twenty years. You know, are they really going to be worth like six, seven, eight million? At some point, there's a limit. You know, and, and I, I think that's part of it. In that, I just don't know how much of a you buy a team now for three billion dollars. These equity guys aren't going to necessarily be happy with selling it for four billion ten years from now, you know. I, I think I think that's part of it. And it, yes, it's very illiquid because it's very hard to sell. You can't just go to the stock exchange and sell a team. You know, there's a lot to it, and so it's one. It's very illiquid. So I, I kind of agree with that. I just generally speaking, I think giving those institutional investors an inroad uh, into management at all is a bad thing. Now, understand that MLB, the NBA, and uh, the NFL all appoint one principal owner. And I'm going to call the NBA owners owners because that's what they are. You can, it's One person has to be the principal owner, and all they're talking about is a non-principal owner. But that's not to say that they can't be leaned on by their partners. And so if you have you know, like the head of some New York equity firm be the principal owner and then his equity firm is the minority owner. Basically what you have in essence is a limited partnership, you know, that's going to be leaned on by the equity firm and that's not probably not a good thing. Yeah, and 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 I'm not I'm not even casting any nefarious uh judgments on this necessarily, but those companies do what they do. They they end companies when they're not profit. They sell. They sell for parts. You know, they mash things together. That you know, they're looking to maximize profits on their investment, and that is that is an, that level of aggressiveness is antithetical to the kind of running a sports team. Yeah, I mean, because those guys like wouldn't hesitate to move a team from one city right. to the other. That's a great example. You know, in a second, and and these sports teams mean a lot to the fabric of the local cities, and so if you have some. You know, Chicago financier own a team in like the Dolphins or something. You know, they're not going to understand how or care. They might understand. They don't care how the Miami Dolphins are built into the fabric of the city of Miami. And I'm making that up, but um, that's the bad side of it. I think that's probably what you're getting at. Yeah, totally. There. You, they're they're making decisions at a different with a different rubric. Yeah, and that's not to say some owners aren't awful. You know, like we're Redskins fans, Redskins fans on this show, and you know nobody's saying Dan Snyder's a good owner, anything like that. Um, but at a minimum, he's not a Wall Street equity firm, at least. <clears throat> so he has that going for him. That's maybe that's the only positive of Dan Snyder. He's not a Wall Street equity fund. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, if you're 
<laughs> we, we might be that be might be a case where it's beneficial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Please, maybe he's, he's the one owner that kids. needs to be. Yeah, maybe he needs to be owned. Maybe he needs to sell to an equity fund. It'd be better than him. <laughs> Not my opinion on this whole thing is just flipped. Um, all right. Well, this kind of leads into our next story because our next story is we're talking about the NFL possibly raising their debt limit because they're really what what this speaks to in the Major League Baseball story is that. There is a shrinking number of people that, or groups of people, or whatever, that can actually pull off buying these teams with skyrocketing valuations, which we, which Steve has mentioned. So in the NFL, one of the things that they're looking to do uh, is possibly raise their debt ceiling, which would allow owners or ownership groups to basically take on more debt in their financing plan to buy a team. And traditionally, the the leagues want to manage that because if they get a bunch of teams in trouble and they start going belly up, that's certainly uh, very bad for the league and could have a, a bit of a domino effect. But in the quest for, you know, new buy-in fees, these ownerships taking, you know, the, being able to handle these valuations, they are looking to possibly allow owners or ownership groups to take on more bad debt. Steve? Yeah. Number one, they're doing it anyway. You know, and they're just ignoring their own rules right now. So this is just sort of a codification of what they're doing anyway. So let's back up and let's explain to people. I know you know this, Chris, but let's explain to people how sports teams are purchased, okay? So if you have a team that's purchased for $3 billion and you have some guy out there who's the owner or girl, woman, <clears throat> who's the owner, um, that person is not writing a $3 billion check. What that person is doing is writing a check for a few hundred million dollars and then he or she will borrow a couple billion dollars and then he or she will have another billion or so or whatever the number is in minority investors okay and so there's going to be debt and a huge amount of debt on this team and so what all the leagues want to do is keep these teams from having too much debt so that if it really goes south the league couldn't step in and take care of it the league doesn't want to have to you know, drop three billion dollars to save a team. Okay, like for example, Frank McCourt used to own the Dodgers, and Frank uh, ran the Dodgers into the ground. At one point, he had to borrow uh, money from uh, th third-party last-chance lenders to pay staff payroll on a monthly basis. <laughs> you know, I mean, not player payroll, like staff payroll. It was really, really bad. And the team, you know, which is obviously one of baseball's preeminent franchises, the franchise of Jackie Robinson, was basically going to fold. And so MLB stepped in, appointed basically a, pro a receiver-type person to run the team, uh, and then Frank put him into bankruptcy after that. But, see, that's what they're trying to avoid. And if there's too much debt on, on the teams, they can't really do it. And what you don't want is Bank of America to own, you know, like the Minnesota Vikings. That would be really bad. And so that's the reason why you don't, you have these debt rules. Now, that was okay when teams were worth like $200 million. But now that they're worth $3 billion, you know, Paul Allen and Stan Kroenke and guys like that and Warren Buffett, these are the guys who have that kind of cash. Like Dan Snyder does not have that kind of cash or even close to that kind of cash. And so um, by raising the debt limit, they are allowing – they're broadening the pool of ownership um, because it's just really hard to raise anywhere close to the amount of cash needed. So it's it's a good thing in some respects. Um, you know, I, I don't even know if there's even a negative in terms of the the fans because I don't know if we any of the fans really care. You know, uh, you know about how much debt's on a team. <laughs> well, what they care is sort of connecting back to our last story. Is they they care when that mismanagement debt etc forces a team to move out of their market so which are you know which are would be potential salves for any team that gets into that into the you know into that predicament and the end yeah, i know that that my beloved hockey is a slightly less you know kind of fiscal profile as the other major sports but just a couple of years ago they had to they had to own a team outright and man and manage it until they could find a proper owner situation so similar thing where a league had to step in and basically just take over a franchise i think for three years 
the NBA did that with the with the New Orleans franchise. Right, that's right. The NBA was running the New Orleans Hornets. And I think they were the Hornets back then, right? I get the name. The, the, the Hornets have been... Anyway, the New Orleans... Because the Hornets at one point... That's Charlotte, but at one point they were in New Orleans. So I'll just say the New Orleans franchise was owned by the NBA. And it was... David Stern was the one who nixed the uh, f- infamous uh, Chris Paul trade to the Lakers. <laughs> right. You know, and, and, that caused that caused people like me to hate David Stern forever. And you don't. And and this is a situation where no one wants that, right? And no one who's a fan or and and the, the leagues don't want this either. That so you know th- they're not looking to take over teams. And David Stern was not. You know, he knew he knew that was a no win situation. He made made the wrong move with that particular blocking the move. But no league wants to be in that that position that the NHL and NBA and Major League Baseball have been in, having to either own outright or and somehow be the executor of a team. That's just a bad look for their league. Yeah, yeah. And so what this is doing is this is is softening up the rules enough to allow uh, to keep that from happening. Now again. Especially Major League Baseball has been doing this for years anyway. You know, like there's no re- Derek, like Derek Jeter's group ownership group did not qualify under MLB rules. They didn't come close to qualifying under MLB rules to buy the Florida Marlins. They're not. They weren't close. They had we have way too much debt. Even the Dodgers had way more debt. You know, like the guy who owns the Dodgers, it runs a New York equity firm actually that has the name Guggenheim involved. You know, so it's a very rich thing, but they had a ton of debt, you know, and so Major League Baseball has been ignoring these rules anyway, and so this is just basically codifying, for lack of a better term, what they're already doing. And and business at this scale, debt is a tool. It's not a problem. Right. Um. Yeah. So, you know, now you and I and listeners out there, you know, stress high credit cards or a mortgage or whatever, like debt has a much different connotation to the sort of individual family or individual person but at that level of business, debt is just a tool that they use to get stuff done, and they, you know, and then later write it off or however they can get, reduce it. But that's all part of the game, and that's why that's why the nuance is really interesting and in how much, and that's what the the cap does. It's like how much can the league actually stomach the risk of the amount of debt that they'll let accrue. And I'll just say, if you want a really good in depth discussion of these issues, team financing. Uh, ownership groups and the rising valuations go back into our archives and find our long discussion about the Chicago Cubs ownership fiasco and then the the related uh, I think deadspin deadspin article which we link to in the show notes so th- that we really kind of you know we uh, here we're staying kind of 10,000 feet above the issue but that when we really dig in with specifics on uh, where these kind of issues intersect yeah, yeah, that was really good. Um, that was from a couple months ago. It was earlier, 2018. Uh, and that article and that show, it really kind of shows sort of what we're talking about here. Yeah, I mean, listen, you're right. Debt is a tool at that level. You know, the, the companies borrow hundreds of millions of dollars, not because they have to, but because they want to. You know, because that's the way they manage their cash flow and that's the way they manage their business. It's not like you and I who, if we want to buy a house, you know, we have to borrow because we don't have a cash. Even if we did, we don't want to spend every cent we have. You know, that's why families do it and that's why it's bad. But in biz, big business like this, it's not that Stan Caston couldn't have raised $3 billion to buy the Dodgers. It's that there was no need to do that because he had a better, a better way. You know, and so all this is doing is this is allowing a greater pool of people the opportunity to own teams. And really, if you want to be positive about it, because we had a pretty cynical show, um, (laughs) what it would really allow is more local ownership. Okay, you know, because maybe you can find guys who actually care about some of these teams. You know, I'm not talking about the Dan Snyder's of the world, you know, but some local owner who doesn't have. $3 $3 billion. Well, if you raise the debt limit, it may be to allow a local ownership group to buy these teams and keep it, keep these teams where they are and ingrained in the fabric of the city rather than cynically moved from Baltimore to Cleveland or whatever. Baltimore, they, from Indianapolis to Baltimore, you know, for example, or whatever. That's the other way around. I had it backwards. The Colts moved from Baltimore to Indianapolis for money reasons. But anyway, I'll shut up. But you get my point. I should almost invite. I should almost see if he wants to come tell the story because I'm gonna on the show at one point because I'm gonna butcher it. But I was talking to my brother-in-law who recently, you know, was in high finance and worked at Nationwide and and which is based or has a big office in Columbus and he had been Columbus, Ohio, and he's been located there for 
20 some odd years. Um, but anyway, he was telling me that he was involved in the financing and the machinations of the Columbus Blue Jackets in the NHL. And really fascinating stories about how Nationwide was brought in and then it only made sense for them to have investments in the area so that when the owners actually, when the valuation jumped and the owners wanted to sell because they were basically ready to cash out, that um, and what who they were planning on selling to was a, a Toronto based interest that wanted to put a second team in that market because that market really is Toronto, Ontario, and all of sort of uh, you know the United States as well, Buffalo, upstate New York, like that. It's not necessarily a political geographic boundary in terms of the fan base. That nationwide was so in the tank on what the stadium meant to its downtown locale that they basically had to pull out all the stops and which included them getting even more into the ownership of the team because to protect their overall investment they couldn't afford for the team to leave even though the original ownership group had their cash out which may have been their goal the whole time with these valuations skyrocketing right in front of them so it's a fascinating look at these machinations and you know you can't get much smaller market than columbus really in in pro sports (laughs) I can't believe you've been hiding this story from us all these years. He just told me Sunday. He just told me Sunday. Okay. Well, <laughs> I want that guy on our show in two weeks telling this story. I can. I can see that if he is wants. fascinating. Yeah, it was a good story. I mean, I he, you know he, he I don't know what arrangements he's got with nationwide that would make a you know this be be able to talk about it, but much past me. Oh, um, who cares? Just have him do it anyway. <laughs> Forget confidentiality. <laughs> Uh, no, but yeah, that's fascinating. And let's talk about that off the air because I do think that's fascinating. Um, but th- that's a perfect example, you know, of, of what we're talking about here. And that's that's it, and this isn't just the NFL. You know, the the story here is that the NFL was is is doing this, but every league, like I said, is doing this. You know, Major League Baseball is doing it. You know, all the you know. In, trust me when I say you know the NBA will be doing it too. For the reasons we said, this is not going to be just an it's just an NFL thing. No, certainly not. And it speaks to the fact both these last two stories that use a shrinking marketplace for owners owners and ownership groups that can pull off buying these teams. Yep. So I mean, even in in a second tier sport like hockey, we've talked about this in the past. The buy in amount for that Las Vegas franchise was eye popping. Enormous, yeah, yeah. Eno- enormous. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, that uh, that that may be the most businessy sports business show we've done in, in quite some time. Yeah, I mean, either you loved it and have listened to every word, or you turned this off fifty minutes ago <laughs> once you realize what we're talking about. One of the two. All right, uh, but that does bring us to the end of this episode. Uh, Steve, why don't you give a rundown of stuff on the network and stuff important to the network. Okay. Um, first of all, we are on Big Heads Media. Now, Big Heads Media has got all sorts of other podcasts about all sorts of other things. Um, you know, the, that anything you could dream up, you know, from pop culture to news and politics and sports, they have literally everything. So go there. Um, we obviously have the Hogside, which is our flagship show with, you know, about the Washington Redskins twice a month or twice a week, rather. And then we have Rick Snyder's show, Seasons of Discontent, which, as he likes to say, is his look at all things Washington, D.C. sports and life. So check that out. And we have great new written content coming just about every day. Rick had a funny tweet recently where I guess he's kind of building off the Capitals, the the Mystics, and the Nats run where he said – he had a tweet that said something along the lines of, I guess this is what it feels like to be a New England sports fan. And I was like, slow down. Slow down. <laughs> slow down a little bit. You know, it's nice to get a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of momentum and not be horrible in all sports. But I don't know if I, don't know if I feel like what it feels like to be a New England fan quite yet. Yeah, not quite yet. And I, you know – I don't think the people watching need to see are anywhere near as obnoxious as New England sports fans. Uh, yeah, it, it's hard to it's hard to beat a mass hole on that front. Um, <laughs> you never you haven't heard that one, Steve? Uh, no, I have not. Yeah, that's that on the East Coast. That's what they're lovingly referred to as. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we'll be back in two weeks. You can find uh, Steve and the Hogsty proper at the Hogsty Twitter account. I'm at Chris Larry33. Also, it's just Business Pod. 
Uh, all right. I guess we'll we'll see you in two weeks. Bye. <laughs>